we're on. All right. Well, let's get started. Uh, Yashan, thanks for talking to us today about Terraform. Um, I think a really good place to start is just tell us what it is and how it works. Uh, cool. Um, well, we founded Terraformation to accelerate global reforestation um, as what we consider to be the most promising and that's a sort of like non-legible word I'm going to use, um, solution to climate change. Um, the reason we started as a startup is actually because you know, we sort of looked at all the possible organizational structures and we decided that a Delaware C Corp is the sort of the fastest way to uh, driving collective action. Um, and so, so sometimes people ask us like, why is it not a nonprofit? Um, and it's just because like nonprofits are kind of slow and ha have various other problems. Um, and, and so we create a company um, and this is intended to hyper accelerate uh, global reforestation. That makes that makes sense. What is it about the, the C Corp incentives that make this faster than a nonprofit? Like in principle, couldn't you do the same exact things under a nonprofit structure? Um, so yeah, some of it is due to the legal structure. And other parts are sort of due to, you know, how people regard both of the types of organizations. Um, I would say that the main thing that seems to distinguish nonprofits is that if you run a nonprofit, you spend like, the executives spend like 80% of their time raising funds, right? And I can't do that. I have to spend like 80% of my time, like getting trees into the ground and building organizational and operational structures that scale getting trees put into the ground. Um, now, on the other hand, they, they do say like for a startup, you're like always fundraising. So like I'm kind of always fundraising also. Um, but that that's one of the main things. It's like where you spend your time. And then there's also mm -hmm. the sort of, if you look at it from like a ideas point of view, like a business is a self-sustaining entity, right? If you create a successful business, it like creates revenue to continue funding and expanding its operations. You can sort of think of a nonprofit as being like not sustainable and that way like, you have to like continue raising funds you use those funds and we have to keep raising more funds so they don't always have the same kind of sustainability thing although you know to sort of shade that a bit in, in more recent times there have been uh nonprofits that are sort of started by you know people with corporate backgrounds who like try to make it sort of in a sustainable entity but but they still have a bunch of other problems and um for example they, they have like more stringent financial and accounting requirements um and, and so, so that just like adds an additional like operational load on top of everything mm -hmm. like yeah it, it makes sense and i guess that you know the other part of it is it's a forcing function the only way for this to work is, is it works as a business right and do you, do you yes yeah there's, there's, um there's there is also the thing where um we don't believe that like our company can do the whole thing, right? We like sort of like calculated like how many trees, how many acres of forests, and even with extremely generous assumptions of efficiency, um, we, we've, we've found that like, okay, well the organization would have to be like the largest company like ever to exist in the world by like several orders of magnitude. Um, and, and so what we really want be is- Be ambitious, we want, that's what they always tell you. They do, and, and we hope to like get there, but, but we wanted to, the things that we have to create a company that is very successful, very visibly successful at doing this and then what i've what i've sort of learned in you know startup is like if startup land is if you create this company that's very successful everyone will copy you right like we're the only company that wants many copycats like usually people are very unhappy when they're like there's like the the sam wars brothers german copycat and then there's the chinese copycat right it's like no 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 we want a thousand copycats right and so if that's if, explicitly part of the strategy is I create this thing that's like successful enough that everyone will copy it and then boom we're, we're done all right so let's uh let's talk a bit more about trees in the ground right you said that you took this approach because you found it to be the most promising and as you said you know the most promising is not necessarily legible but there's plenty of interest right now in carbon capture technologies um Casey Hanmer is working on his terraform industries um basically getting LNG out of the atmosphere and having Again, a profit driver for carbon capture, similar to this. There's kind of not exactly wackier, but um, more out there ideas, including you know powering that carbon capture via nuclear to produce the LNG. Why this approach of reforestation? Um, 
so there, there's this thing that I learned. So, so okay, first of all, I, I'm not actually like against the other carbon, the other what are carbon capture methods. I, I'm, I'm I sort of have this view that like we have a lot of humans, and you know a lot of the humans are smart, and so I actually think that everyone should actually just kind of work on the thing that they like the most, because there's there's a sort of specific unique multiplier thing, right? Like if you're working on the thing that you're really into, you're going to take it like, you know, 10 times further than anyone else. Um, so so I, I sort of feel like, um, yeah, everyone should like work on their their thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason I eventually focused on reforestation was not because I particularly like, like trees. I mean, I, I like them now because I worked with them for a long time and it's like, they're pretty cool, right? Was <laughs> I actually took this like longitudinal view of like every carbon capture technology, right? And whilst like, depending on how you classify them, like some or many of them are very promising. There's this one overriding factor, which was like hyperscale, right? So like the one like really unique and counterintuitive thing I learned when I was like working in Silicon Valley, just like, creating these like really big scale systems, right? I like Facebook and Reddit, and even actually like PayPal. The thing that I learned that's like very counterintuitive that I think is a lesson that most people don't realize is that you want to use as like little technology as possible. And you want to use like the sort of oldest and most reliable technology because when you take something and you try to like do like a billion of them, like literally a billion of them, right? Like there are novel technical challenges because you run yes. into a whole bunch of like new like I was about models. to say because you're you're talking about these tried and tested technologies, but come on, we're we're talking about billion scale reforestation. That's that's not going to ever be something old. We've never done that. Yeah, before. It, it, exactly. It's like several orders of magnitude above anything that we've done. It's like literally the largest project that mankind mankind will have undertaken. And so when you're trying to do that and you're like debugging, like when you're debugging, you're trying to like narrow it down to one bug, right? And so you want to eliminate all of the bugs that come from the technology being new. Because when you can't tell what the bug is, you're not you know, able to solve it, right? So, so you want to eliminate as many of the sort of like new tech types of bugs. Um, and so you have to find something that's like the most well understood and reliable technology. And, and to, to put like a finer point on it, you actually want to make it the, the least not understood thing because like you know we still need to know many things about trees but they're like the least not understood yeah thing. it's about putting the technical right. risk in the right place right exactly it is about yeah. right that, that's a good way of putting it. it's about like budgeting your technical risk and so I, I we like made this budget that's like all is it of the technical risk is in like the the hyperscaling part of it and so, yeah. so hence trees right so yeah um i mean that, that that's really reasonable and i think you know as a, as a blanket statement about these types of efforts um, of carbon capture or sequestration or whatever you'd like to call it, really, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of terms of art, right? It's interesting that we are, historically, environmentalism has been about taking a, let's say, let's say a, a negative or reactionary approach. And I don't mean negative in the sense of a moral valence. I mean, negative in the sense of doing something less right or reducing the amount of something. Whereas here um, with things like terraformation, we're taking a, a positive approach. I mean, in essence, this is a geoengineering project, right? We're using we're using trees as machines to do a certain type of geoengineering on the earth. Um, that's a very relatively new phenomenon. Certainly, the the sort of the the ecological movement that started in the 70s uh, in the United States and elsewhere really never emphasized this kind of positive approach to change. I'm curious about how you think about that, like. This is this is like a really positive step. It's like we're going to do we're gonna take the carbon out of the atmosphere. Right. We're not gonna produce less carbon, we're gonna take the carbon out of the atmosphere. That's you. How do you think about that on balance? Um well, well first, you are correct that this is a geoengineering solution. Um when when I was sort of looking at all the climate solutions, I, I was actually thinking so so. You're saying this kind of positive, but I sort of proceeded from a negative mindset, actually, which is like here so here, here's the thought process I went through, which is um First, I thought, okay, so what, what is the main solution that everyone thinks is to climate change? And it, it, and it was like, okay, well, it's reducing fuel emissions. And it was, this is like 2017, right? We we're in like the Trump era of things. Um, and we're like, well, okay, well, that's not working very well. What if we totally fail at reducing fuel emissions? Are we still gonna, like, are we still gonna die? Is there like no way then? And the answer is 
Well, no, if we could re we could draw down enough carbon fast enough, then we might still succeed even if we fail at reducing fuel emissions. Now there's a fine point here between saying you shouldn't reduce fuel emissions and as one person not having the power to cause the world to reduce fuel emissions, right? Like I have the power to do something, but if the world isn't gonna reduce fuel emissions, I'm not gonna just like lay down and die. Yep. I'm gonna try to do something that like is sufficiently you know, car captures enough carbon, right? So that maybe we still survive and it's okay, right? So it, it was actually a, hey, let's say we, we, you know, the other people I can't control, like fail to reduce fuel emissions, what can I do? And so then I was like, okay, I guess it's gonna have to be some big geoengineering thing. And so I, was, I then looked at every single geoengineering proposal, right? And luckily the, the Royal Society of London in 2008 like did a lot of that work for me. And they like had this like long like report about like evaluating all the geoengineering proposals. And so like, that was like a good starting point, right? Um, and so if you actually ask yourself the question, okay, let's say I'm actually gonna implement a geoengineering proposal which by the way, different question than most people ask because usually when people talk about that, they're like at a dinner party or a salon and they're just like talking about geoengineering, right? They're not really thinking about what it's gonna to mean to do it. And if you think about actually practically doing it, what's gonna entail, you suddenly realize that there's a bunch of like factors and, and it's a very like multi-dimensional thing. It isn't just like pick the cheapest one. You sort of realize that, oh, okay, so like, you want safety and safety means different things. Like one of them is like, does it move the earth to like a new equal stable equilibrium or is it like an unstable equilibrium may have to keep putting energy to like hold it there, right? Another one is like, it's obviously gonna be a big system. So like if bad actors gain control of it or even unreliable actors gain control of it, like does it become a weapon, right? Because like, for example, like um, giant space mirrors would be like a weapon if somebody got control of it, right? And, yes. and like. And even like uh, the solar it's the radiation problem. management. It's the big problem, yeah. exactly. The, what you were about to say with solar radiation management with like uh, the, the plants with sodium crystals in the upper atmosphere is that de facto you also have a weapon. Yes, right? exactly. Like any any large tool is inherently yes. a weapon, right? And, and, and so like, um, or even just like a big accident waiting to happen, <laughs> right? Like, like yes. it, it, right. There, there's plenty of like large things where like you know people stop paying attention and then it became dangerous because you know you, you weren't like working as hard at it. Um, and, and then and then you have like you know the, the sort of like reliability concerns. You know those all, all these. I had something like twelve different factors, and if you look at all of them it rapidly became clear that like the only one that was like either good or medium on all of these criteria was reforestation. And then you just have this like sort of scale thing about like, if there, is there enough water and land, right? And it turns out you could, you could find out, find ways around that um, with, with like solar desalination and stuff, right? But it was the only one that was like reachable to any great scale given like immediately given the current technology and the political will that we had. So it is actually a geoengineering plan. Um, I'm a technologist. So I sort of think of it as like, Hey, I invented this, like, you know, if, if someone said I invented this machine that like pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and it's self replicating, it's cheap. Um, you don't need special training. You, you don't need like a college education to operate it. And like some of the units like produce like, organic food while you're running it, right? Like you'd be like, oh, that is the magical like carbon sequestration gadget that we've been looking for, right? And we actually have this thing. Um, so that's actually how I arrived at the solution. It was from a very uh, tech minded thing. And, and I think that also the problem of climate change is very much for many people, a proxy for other issues. Um, if you think of like the sort of left wing environmental approach that has dominated most conversation about climate change. Um, a lot of it is mixed up with, I wouldn't say it's like anti-capitalist, but what I've realized is sort of, it's, it's anti whatever is the prevailing system. Like if we still had the Soviet Union, it would also be like anti-Soviet communism actually. Cause like the, the Soviet Union was also like very heavily. We did, we did <laughs> have anti-Soviet communism. 
We, we, did, we did, right? But it, it's, just, it's, it's just like whatever is the present system is obviously most responsible for the present state. So it becomes this countercultural, like against whatever the establishment is thing, right? And the other thing I learned about solving big problems is although there's this phrase, kill two birds with one stone, and people love that phrase, you actually never want to do that. You never want to mash two big problems together and think, yes, oh, well, all we have to do is overthrow capitalism and it'll solve climate change. Or we, or there's always like overthrow patriarchy and solve climate change or like overthrow colonialism and solve climate change, right? It's like- Not okay, have babies yeah. and that will- Right, solve right, 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 exactly. Like, oh, too much population. It's like all this stuff. It's I like, agree with that. No, 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 I right? Like, okay, that. maybe, like, I'm not saying those are the, way, the like, way that I, The way that I usually put this, the way that I think about this as a founder is, um, you basically can't afford more than one miracle at a time. You should have one miracle at a time, at least one, but more yes. nobody is lucky enough to pull off more than one miracle at a time. Uh, that's kind of the boundary at which we try to operate. So I absolutely understand this perspective, this worldview. Yeah, exactly. like actually trying to kill two birds with one stone is, it's actually hard. <laughs> it's, like, it's like two birds, right? Like you can't actually do it. It's like the nice thing and everyone wants to do it. And it's like, no, you kill one bird, and then you kill the next bird. You just like do them one at a time. So so it was oh, always so killing, for me it was like just is, who's killing all these birds. <laughs> right, right? Like, it was like that. Yeah. Right. You wonder like, about some of these turns of phrase. Like what were people doing in the 19th century that this was a <laughs> right, like when was the thing that you like, wanted the, to do? The cat's yeah. out of the bag. Why was the cat in the bag? <laughs> anyway, um, so I you know I think this is a very reasonable approach. I think that. You know, moving all the risk into the scale part of it rather than than the sort of the technical implementation part of it, right? Other people have taken other approaches. Again, like Casey's taken the approach of um, putting the technical risk into making like this really, really simple LNG production system out of atmospheric capture. What about the social aspects of this, right? So I know that terraformation is, as you say, very community oriented. Uh, it's about, you know, making something simple, repeatable, replicable. In fact, you want it to be replicated even by other companies. So you, you sort of invite competition um how does that fit together like is that not also another thing that needs to happen like getting this kind of like social part right making people want to do this or did, does, is that just solved by money um it is well okay so, so there's like two parts of it that have to do with community and and they're they're kind of different so uh, the, the first one is um any climate solution is necessarily global in scope. That is a thing that humans have very rarely grappled with or ever thought about. Um, and, 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 and so like, this is funny, every single person on the planet is a stakeholder in whatever it is that you do. So everyone's gonna have an opinion, everyone's going to be affected. That is not usually the case with any startup. You build a SaaS company that, you know, there's a person on the planet who doesn't care about that. With climate, everybody cares about it and is affected by it. So there's this thing to be said for the maximally inclusive solution. I know like inclus inclus inclusion, whatever is like a buzzword, but this is actually really important because if you have a solution that is very high tech, it means that it can only be implemented by a, um, a relatively small number of countries that have a sufficient technological and manufacturing base. And that means that those countries or those you know, parties are really just like or specific organizations in those countries have control over the entire solution, right? And that is actually a concentration of power because if you're the only one who can solve climate change, you have an enormous amount of power. And for people who don't really understand this, like I'll, I'll present another view for you, which is like, what if, let's say, you know, the, 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 the Western Europe and the US are kind of slow in, in sort of dealing with climate change. And then China decides to do like all of the SRM overflights. Like they decide they're just gonna solve climate change, right? And they do it in like five years, right? Which is like technically possible. Imagine if China were the only country that could solve climate change and no one else could do it, right? You would feel pretty uncomfortable with that. Especially since you can also selectively decide where you deploy the, you know, the particles, right? And we've seen that there has a localized effect because of the, you know, the North yes. Atlantic like shipping thing, right? So China could decide not to do it over the US and only do it over regions where they have allies. 
right? Okay. So, so from there, you can say like geopolitically, you would not want that. What you really want is you want something that is sufficiently low tech that it is very technologically inclusive. That is to say, almost every country can participate. And so like with a climate solution, you want that so that it isn't just a few countries because with just a few countries having it, it's not just the geopolitical concentration of power. It's also that like those countries are now, like if you have a macroeconomic dislocation in those countries and they're unable to like continue the upkeep of the solution, which by the way, will be very expensive, right? Then suddenly you have this like huge spike, right? Then you have a breakdown, it's actually brittle. But if you have it so that every country can participate, it becomes much more resilient and much more participatory, right? So the first one is kind of the global inclusion thing of it, right? Um, the second one is very specific to forests. So mm -hmm. there have been attempts to you know, plant lots of forests and setting aside the sort of like monoculture problem of it. There, some of the attempts are like a rich company goes and like buys a ton of land in some like developing country and then kicks everyone out and says, okay, we're gonna plant a huge forest here. And this is gonna offset all of our like emissions. It's like our, very often it's been like oil companies or some energy companies. Um, and the problem is you can't really plant a forest and have it successful for the long term unless the people who live there are involved with it and benefit from it. You can't actually take a bunch of people and kick them off the land um, because the reality is that property rights are not what you write down in a book and say someone owns. Property rights are really like the people who live there, right? They own the forest, whether or not it's written in some book and you know, your you know, faraway country owns it or not, because if they're not benefiting from it, they will eventually go down and go and cut down the trees just out of like economic necessity, not like maliciousness or anything, right? And so like, you have to make it so that the local community is one that, like you have, the program has to be one that like involves and benefits the local community. Like whoever is living there on the land needs to feel like it is their forest, they own it and they benefit from its continued existence. So, so that is a, it seems kind of obvious when I say it that way, right? But mm -hmm. that is not necessarily the standard practice that has been in the past, right? And, and that has led to basically the failure of like many, many projects. Basically every project that's been not done like that has failed, right? And, and so there's just been this, you know, people say like, oh, you know, there's all these projects that failed. Well, actually, there's projects that have failed and projects that have succeeded. And the projects that have succeeded have very clear characteristics. And the one that is the most determinist, like the as the greatest determining factor of project success is the involvement and benefit of the local community. So that's like this more sort of, you know, like micro community aspect of it. And then the makes sort sense. of global in inclusion, techno I call it technological inclusion um, to sort of describe the benefits of it being low tech. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot easier to get sort of many trees in a community than one laptop per child, right? It's, it's technically, on that side of it, it's a lot. The, the bar right. is, just, is just lower because trees already exist and work. Um, yeah, there's a few more aspects of this that I want to ask about, but let me let me come at this from a different angle. You know, all of this sounds really good. It seems like a good self-sustaining idea. It seems like it hits you know various possibilities to it. Um, why like? You know, what are some reasons this might not work? Like, what's the postmortem here? Where does this go wrong? Um, there's like a billion reasons why it won't, won't work. Like, my, my current, like, projected chance of success for my company is, like, 1%. So, but that's up from 0.1% two years ago. So, our chances of success have gone up by 10x. Um. So, and Anton said a startup is almost fa always fundraising. So I think <laughs> we're hearing the right. pitch now. <laughs> um, yeah. If you're the kind of person who likes to win, this is not the way to go. <laughs> this is the, like, you're probably going to lose try anyways, like path of life. Um, so you know how they say like at the beginning stages of your startup, your biggest competitor is not a competitor. It's like the back button. Yeah, like so that, nobody cares. Yeah, it's like nobody cares. They're just like, ah, whatever, back, right? Okay, that's like currently, I think like the biggest danger, which is, so here's this like funny thing about, um, 
uh, about like re global reforestation as a climate solution. It's very much like the, uh, yeah, is, are people familiar with like the stone soup parable? Yes. Has, any, has anyone heard, about, heard of that? Okay, I, I see like one nodding. Okay, this, this, this is like, okay, right, 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 right. I'll tell the stone soup parable, which, which is this. Do, okay. they, do they not teach this in school anymore? What the hell? Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I learned it. Like it's it's, it's all of, okay. Well, it's a, it's a funny little story. It's like okay, this was a poor village, right? And one day a stranger arrives in the poor village, and you know he's got his little knapsack, stack, you know the stick with the little thing. Um, and he's he goes from door to door asking people if they have any food. Um, and he goes there, and they're all very suspicious of this new stranger. And he asks them like, "Hey, do you have any food?" And they're like, "No, no, we're starving. We don't have any food at all." And he goes in the next next house and goes, "Do you have any food?" And they go, "No, we're we're a starving poor village. We don't have any food at all." Um, and he goes like, and he goes to a few houses, and they all tell him the same thing. And so he says, he go he goes to the center of the village, and he says loudly, "Like, whoa, damn, dude! Like this village is so poor, no one has any food. I guess we're gonna have to make some stone soup." And everyone said, so, you know, things like, "What the hell? Like stone soup?" Um, and he says, okay, does anyone have like a pot, right? And someone at least has like a pot, like a big cauldron. And so what he does is he like fills the cauldron with water from the river and he makes a fire under the cauldron and he, he opens his knapsack and he's got this big stone, big stone. He goes, I'm going to make some stone soup. And he puts the stone into the, the bottom of the, the pot, right? And it's, it's bubbling, it's boiling, right? And he says, like, all right, this soup is going to be really great. Like, you know what make this even better? And people are like watching him because like, what the hell's this guy, right? Um, and he says like, it would be great if like, if we could just add an onion. Does anyone have an onion? And so like someone says like, oh yeah, you know, I think I have like an old yellow onion in the back of my pantry, right? And they go and they get the onion, they slice up the onion um, and, and they put it in, in the stew, right? And then it's boiling and boiling. And you know, onions are like, you know, the smell gets, gets everywhere, right? And you're like, people can smell it. It's like, wow, the soup is gonna be great. Right? It's like, you know, it'd be great if we had like a potato does anyone have a potato? And then someone says, yeah, you know, I, I guess I got a potato, right? And so they bring out the potato and they cut a potato and they put it in the soup, right? Um, and it's boiling and you can smell it, right? And then he's just like, you know, it'd be really great if there were like a side of meat, right? Does anyone have a side of meat? And then lo and behold, somebody happens to have a side of meat, right? Like, and they, they bring out the side of meat, they, they cut it up and they, they put it in there. And then, you know, like carrots or whatever. Right? And then, and so he does this, right? And pretty soon everyone's contributed, right? Like some, some little thing. And then they make the stone soup and he invites everyone to partake of the stone soup. And they all agree it's the greatest stew that they've ever had. Um, and, and then, and they think the, the, the stranger is a genius because he made soup, this delicious soup from a stone. Um, and then, and, and, you know, they, whatever, make merry, whatever. In the morning, the stranger packs up his stone and leaves. Okay, and, and that forever they, they tell the story about the stranger who made soup from stone. Okay, so reforestation, it, global reforestation as a climate solution is basically stone soup. Unlike many other proposed or imagined carbon drawdown methods, we have everything we need to do this. The problem is actually that nobody is really trying. If I could wave a magic wand and tomorrow everyone had it in, in their brains, we're going to restore all the forests on the earth, right? Like between one and three trillion trees worth, um, which is, by the way, like there were three trillion more trees like at, at the when humans came on the planet, right? So that's, that's roughly the amount we've lost. If we just decided tomorrow, okay, we're going to reforce the earth, we would do it. And then it would be done and we'd be there, right? It wouldn't actually solve all of climate change, but it would be such a huge shot in the arm in terms of like, oh my God, humans can do this huge thing that we would rapidly then go and like solve all of the rest of the problem, right? And so the funny thing about reforestation is that it's a, it's like a stone soup or or also the, the other one I use is like magic toe shoes, right? It was like, never, it was never the magic toe shoes. It was always you, right? And And so when I say like the biggest problem is the back button, it's really that like, no one's doing anything, right? And if we all actually just went and did it, we would succeed because we have everything we need. We just need to go and do it. Um, everything else like, um, like, like fires 
is one thing, or like pests, or or like you know just people cutting down trees. All of those are solvable problems that have been solved many times because that's just effective forest and fire management. Like we also know how to do all that stuff. Like the the reason why this is like a much better solution than most people think is because all the components are well known. They're all like something that is known within the collective knowledge database of mankind. We don't have to discover anything particularly new. It's not like self-landing rockets, right? Which needs a new algorithm, right? Like new, well, you don't need new science, right? Let's take a new algorithm to do this, right? You don't really have to do that. We know how to do it. It's highly distributed. If every country decided it was going to re reforest like its land, like it's not like another country would need to like get involved. Well, that's like technically not exactly true, but but like it's roughly true. Right? So we have everything we need. And the problem really is just like getting everyone off their ass. Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. Anna, why don't we uh why don't we take a pause here and open it up for for, for questions from the audience to spur some discussion here? I see a lot of chats that are avoided reading because they get distracting. If I can read stuff uh, yeah, a lot of really, really good comments in the chat from literary uh, quotes uh, to thoughts on cooperation and the right amount of background lighting for one's birds to fall asleep during a Zoom uh, event. Um, I think we have a lot of engineers and environmentally inclined people, researchers, thinkers in the room. So I would really just love to hear from you guys and, and how does, I mean... How do, how does this idea sound? Um and and what would be what would be your first first take? I think Michael has um his hand up. Anton, do you see the uh hand raise? Yeah, I see I see that hand. Go ahead, Michael. Oh hey Michael. Hi, yeah. Um yeah, a great idea. And this is quite interesting the way that you've presented it here today. I was wondering, uh, I suppose I had two sort of questions, and but they, they link to each other. So you can probably answer them or kill two birds with one stone, in fact. Um, but no, so um, yeah, no. So um, basically, I, I suppose you talked about having buy-in from like local communities and stuff like that so that they view the forest as something that is beneficial to them. Um, like, unfortunately, however, like, it does seem that, like, right now, the economics of it is such that, like, cutting down the forest and then using it for a different kind of land use, sort of a cattle ranch and growing soy, building a factory there, whatever, right now seems to be much, much more profitable than maintaining it as a forest. What kind of solutions, I suppose, have you thought of that would change that economics um, to sort of, yeah, it, it fix that kind of imbalance in that equation, making it so that, you know, this the, the buy-in is there from the community. Um, okay, th that was one question, right? Yes, and I suppose the other okay. related to just about like global land use currently, we, most of the, the land that we've cut down with trees, we've replaced with agriculture. And that's quite, uh, it's critical for our food supply for us to have that agriculture. And I suppose that links to the, the economics question of it, because the reason it, uh, that it's being used for agriculture is profitable, among other things. So, I mean, I suppose just how do we solve these problems of, you know, zero sum land use? Oh, OK. Um, OK, well, per our you know earlier talk, I will answer them one at a time. So um, and <laughs> thank you for thoughtfully asking one and then the other. Um, So, so the answer to the profitability of land thing is that like as a general statement, that's like mostly true, but not always true. Um, and there, there are many places where it's not true for various reasons. And a lot of them have to do with there's a local community living on land that has not generally been viewed as uh, economically profitable to use for other things, right? It's So it's kind of just like, fallow or it's denuded or it's just like not really considered like it's not like commercially exploitable right because, because the, the sort of other side of the coin of sort of economic current economic models that profit off of land is that they also tend to go for like the most easily exploitable land so there's a lot of land that's like not easily exploitable right and communities which do not require necessarily a profit maximizing um sort of use of that land they just need like some sort of net benefit from the land which isn't already being used right it, it turns out there's a like 
if you if you if you sort of narrow the scope of land down to like this is land we can get a lot of stuff on that's not all the land on the planet there's a lot of land where just like stuff is like marginal or just kind of growing in a way that's not like really exploitable but can be planted as forests because if you're trying to restore something as a forest ecosystem you don't need land that is fertile in the way that prevailing methods of agriculture require the land to be fertile right so so this is this is sort of a um if you get down into the details it turns out a, it turns out there's a lot of margin to work with kind of answer right that, that, that's that's sort of the, the general form of the center and and so many of these communities are uh they're not like really really wealthy right but they would be more prosperous if the land that was near them was more fertile because if you can reforest some of the land like you could do it in like a checkerboard pattern right like it improves the rainfall and water and soil conditions of other land which then makes it nearby that it makes it more fertile as agricultural land so you're actually creating more agriculturally available or fertile land you can also layer agroforestry on you know underneath the canopy this is highly dependent on the local biome and species that are available all right so I, I can't give you like a general answer it's actually like in every place i i guess the, the general form of the answer is there's a lot of margin to play with and there's a lot of communities living in those margins where you could take that land and there's a positive delta that you can do to it by helping them restore the native forest and it both improves the land and just generally improves their living conditions um so I'll sort of use that to like segue to the, the global thing, which is because there's this margin, it's like a whole continuum. And most of the time, everyone looks at like the far continuum of the most fertile, exploitable agriculture land, right? And, and sort of things like, well, that's the only place you can also like restore forest, right? But like the whole point of forest is that they originally came about on land that was like not Fertile, right? It's not like you had a bunch of fertile land, you know, on the planet, and then like for forests came about. Like forests came about and made the land fertile by like you know cycling all the carbon into the soil, right? And then they got like cut down. So along most of this continuum, you have land that is not in direct competition with um, like the, the most profitable agriculture, right? And so what we're trying to do is there's a sort of like middle because you don't actually want like the, the the hardest land to work on right you want land that's kind of like that's actually just like just downstream of the most fertile land where the agriculture thing makes sense and then there's land that's like where they, they deem it like it's kind of fallow it's been like maybe it's like over harvested it's not that great but you can restore a forest on that land, right and it is and, and so that doesn't compete with the with any high profitability agriculture because the agriculture has already been deemed not profitable on that land, right? But you can restore a forest there. It can capture carbon. There's various ways of monetizing that. There's like agroforestry, ecosystem services, which is an indirect way of, you know, like improving the runoff and the erosion, which improves like insurance outcomes of like nearby land. Um, and then also carbon credits, as shaky as that is, seems to actually be emerging as like a fairly reasonable way. I have lots of things to say about carbon and how both awful and great the carbon market should be. Um, but in any case, like there's a there's a lot of ways of like monetizing that land, right? And what we're trying to do is like once you can do some of it, it drives this trend where more and more people see that you can do that. And that actually drives the perception of value. So it sort of changes the economic equation gradually over time. Um, so, so this, the whole answer is basically you can work in the margins and that's enough to prove more margin and then you can pull everyone along. Um, and, and so because there's a lot of land that like, although we say like a lot of land has been cleared for agriculture and it's like mainly used for agriculture, it's actually just like a lot of the most fertile land has been used for agriculture. And there's a bunch of other land that no one kind of talks about because nobody cares about it because, you know, if you can't use it for agriculture and you can't build your city there, it's worthless, right? what I did near the beginning of my evaluation of the solution was I was like, okay, would we be able to do this on land that nobody cares about? Like 
would we be able to restore enough forest assuming that all the land that people currently own and care about, like all those people didn't want to allow us to plant forests on it, right? Is there enough like fallow land? And if we could solve the freshwater problem, it turns out with solar desalination in a reasonably economic way, is there enough land? It turns out there is enough land, right? And there are enough um, examples of desert restoration, right? It's not like planting invasive species in a desert. It's restoring desertified land, right? Where there's not enough water, but if there were more water here, the native species that are there would just bloom in greater numbers. And you already see that because like, you know, occasionally you have an oasis, right? And those are native species. It's just because like a bunch of water collected in that region, right? So there's enough of that land that could be restored to forest that would draw down or offset a significant fraction of current emissions. Kind of roundabout, but that that kind of answer your question. Yeah, no, official, sure. great answer. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, you can go. Anyone else? It's a lot yeah, of. I wanted details. to ask. Go ahead, hey, Sean. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about. Um, you mentioned carbon credits and your complicated thoughts about it. In terms of what are the what's the main drivers of revenue when it comes to these projects as as of now, and how do you see? Carbon revenues news in particular playing a role now and in the future, recognizing there's a lot of complexities in the market, a lot of controversies, et cetera. I was just curious about your high level take on that. Um, okay, let me, let me try to sort my enormously complicated cloud of thoughts into like a. <laughs> okay, so. Um, okay, okay, I'm first going to give you the, the sort of like. The basic core answer as to why carbon markets for nature-based solutions are hard and complicated. And that reason is that nature is messy. It's like very hard to measure, right? There's a lot of diversity. In fact, like you want to maximize the diversity, which actually means you get the most unpredictable and highly diverse outcomes, right? Like you literally want that, right? Like you, you want to maximize bi biodiversity, you want like, 50 species of trees, you don't want one species of trees, right? And that's in direct, um, uh, th that's in direct opposition with your attempts to, haha, make it legible, right? Because if you have one species of tree, it's well characterized, even though every single one of those trees is different, right? So it's like, how much carbon is sequestering? Blah, blah, blah. Like, and you don't want that. You want like 50 different species of trees. You want this huge, like chaotic explosion of life, right? And it's very hard to, um, to measure. Uh, that is, I think, the core reason why carbon markets, because markets seek to make everything legible and regular and, and sort of therefore they're like investable and controllable and all, all these things. Something right? something we've talked about many times in these salons, Anna, as you recall, with, with respect to science funding. So it, it's the same everywhere. It, it, exactly. Right. And, and so like that, that's fundamentally difficult. Um, on the other hand, um, you can sort of figure out averages, right? And and you can get like over large enough like sample sizes, you can get like some sort of average. So it's like kind of okay and doable. And over the past, uh, I would say like 30 or 40 years, the experience of, you know, pro forestation, reforestation people, the people who have worked in this industry for a very long time, the carbon markets as horribly flawed as they are, and they're like some of the most flawed markets I've ever seen, Right, like in some ways, crypto is a more legible market than like carbon markets. Right, like they they have found that it is the only way to direct the volume of money needed to fund these projects. Like they've done basically, like you know, sometimes I hear people like, "Well, you know, why don't you like sell T-shirts and mugs, right?" Or you get donations. It's like the volume of money that's involved, even though you get a lot of people, it's like very popular, right? Like people kind of buy a T-shirt. It's just not enough money. Like every other way of getting money to these. Uh, to these to these projects at the scale that is needed is just too small. So what what you're sort of left with is this thing where everyone is working very very hard to try to try to improve both the science and then the monitoring and verification methods of carbon markets and carbon accounting. And the I sort of take it as like the fact that this market has not cratered and been left for dead because it started 
formally, technically, like I think 2007 at the Kyoto Accords was like the first time they, they had like, you know, a carbon credit or carbon market idea, right? The fact that like over all this time, even though like so many shitty things have happened, it's so unreliable, means that there is fundamentally a very, very strong inherent demand for carbon, for people to want to put mo give money to people who do the actual work of sequestering carbon through nature-based solutions, right? Like there's just so much demand that even though the market itself is like, like this cracked up crazy thing that's like fundamentally unreliable in certain places has like, it, it's actually like the, the amount of scamming is actually like, su like surprisingly low. It's mostly just the inherent hardness of the problem that it's still going, that people are still trying to do these carbon markets. Just like speaks to like the inherent need and demand for carbon accounting. When I say accounting, I use it in a very you know general sense of the word. Um, and so, like, <laughs> my answer is kind of like, like I don't know, right? Because, because I'm an engineer and I want things to be really, really clear, right? And so I'm faced with this thing that's like, the more I learn about it, the more clearly and clear it has to be, right? Like, I, you know, I'll like say, oh, well, how, oh, how I only account it, account for it, like with this way or this variable, um, and then, and then I learn more about it. It's like, well, no, actually, this variable like goes like crazy sometimes, right? <laughs> it's like, like you just like can't account for it. So I'm not really sure where it's going to end up. Um, I will tell you something very interesting, though. Um, I think that there will be more carbon market scandals. I will even say that I'm sure that if our company is successful, we will be involved in one of them. And the reason I say this is not because we're shady, but because one of the reasons why you have these carbon market scandals is because the science is improving so rapidly. Here's one thing, like if you read all these articles that sort of report on these scandals, like Bloomberg, Guardian, New Yorker, right? You'll notice somewhere that there's always a statement in there where the company or whoever's involved says, this project was done according to the best scientific standards known at the time, right? Like, and the, the Kariba project, like the South Pole one is like, that was done according to the best standards known at the time in 2013. And what happens is, some of it's like we look back and we say it's like shady, but actually it's we had 10 years of new science where we knew how every we, we knew how to measure everything way better and we knew all these problems, right? And so inevitably, because the science is advancing so quickly, everything that you do five years ago or 10 years ago is gonna look like crap, right? Because you just know so much more now. Right. And, and so like that's actually good news that you know, the frontier of science and the collect and our collective knowledge is advancing. But what it looks like is every few years, the thing that you did five years ago looks like crap because you know so much more now. And one of the things I'm happy about is the science in understanding this. There's a way more energy putting being put into understanding, measuring and, and just you know, like forest dynamics, all these things. Right. Like in five years, we're going to know so much more. Everything that we're trying to do today is going to be crap. Right. And so I am quite sure that in the success case, five to 10 years from now, something that we're doing today, that we're doing you know, with all good faith in the best correct, in the most correct way possible, according to the latest science, we're gonna look back on it and be like, oh, wow, that's like totally crap. Like the accounting is completely wrong. These carbon credits are worth nothing right? <laughs> or something like that. And there's gonna be a big scandal, right? And like, you know, my own commitment is just like, look, when we find out, we're going to be the first ones to tell you. That's the best I can do, right? Like instead of someone else breaking it, um, we'll tr we will always try to red team our red team our our own projects to sort of break them, right, or show where we're wrong. But I'm I am very confident that the side effect of ra rapid and great scientific under advancement and understanding is that we will have more scandals <laughs> because we'll know so much more, and everything we're doing today. It's gonna look like look terrible, but it is. Did I address everything in your in your question? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think you're right. The answer is just like throwing your hands up. We'll see what happens in the future. It's all a lot of very confusing. Yeah. But thanks. We was like we just all try our best. Um, you know, and like that's all our future generations can ask of us. All right, James, you're up. Yeah, um, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on um, you mentioned, and these are similar conversations I've had with like Neil Spackman. I, I think you probably are aware of him and like his project about how 
the forest doesn't stay a forest or become a forest without the local community engagement as part of the forest really and and it's about getting the people on board getting the local like the the local communities on board to like steward their own thing and he talks a lot about this in a lot of his writings as well i've talked with him about it as well and so i'd love to hear your thoughts on like how do you get the local people on board how do you build the stewardship relationship in the community um and yeah i just just any, any sort of challenges or thoughts that you have on on methods for getting that kind of relationship with the people getting people to to take on their own sort of management and environmental stuff there um i'm in contact with neil right now um, <laughs> um i figured we yeah, we, we may be having an we may have an essay coming out soon based on like his thoughts. Um, so I guess a broad way to characterize what we do right now is we work on a pull model rather than a push model. Although I go around advocating forest restoration, I'm mostly advocating it towards um let's let's use some terms like the powerful global north decision makers right i, I t those are the people who are trying to get to do something when it comes to the local communities on the ground we don't think it's a really good idea to go to some random community and say like hey you should like reforest let me get you on board with this right um because like you kind of just like you, you don't know where people are maybe it's not their priority right now right because like many communities right that's not the thing that they're thinking about it's not the thing that they need um there's, there's a lot of people talk about it. It's, like it's kind of like a neo-colonialist sort of thing. Um, and, and I sort of understand where that comes from in the, the current discourse. But but I'm also just like a, I, I've learned that like in my life, you know, like people tell you what they need and what they want, right? And you don't need to like tell them that, right? The, the reason I, I like advocate for this solution is because people are also saying, we want a climate solution. Hey, Ishan, what are you doing? Right? And so, so, so we work on a poll model. And, and what that means is the communities that we work with, what we did was we said, hey, we have this accelerator program that can teach you all the things you need to know about like restoring forests in the best way possible, how to create the infrastructure like seed banks, nurseries, how to operate nurseries, right? How to like maximize planting out output, right? Based on general principles combined with your local knowledge, because it's actually very species dependent, right? Um, and we say, so we say we have this thing and we were lucky that like, as, as we hired people, we developed this global network of people who just like knew everyone. It turns, turns out the reforestation world is like fairly small, right? Like, you know, it's like, hey, you know, Neil? Yeah, right, <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing, right? And so like Neil knows a bunch of groups, right? People know whatever. So we just put the word out and said like, we can help you with this. And we work on a poll model, which is usually the community has some need. They want their forest back they remember in the time of their grandfather that there was a thriving forest and it's no longer there for whatever reason. How do you restore it, right? Or one of the groups that we worked with actually was not, what was it was actually a hunter gatherer group and not, and they, what they wanted is they wanted to actually transition to an agriculture based forest restoration, agroforestry lifestyle. Right, and so they want to learn. So there's a whole bunch of like seed banking, like basic agriculture stuff. Um, so in many cases, actually in all cases, it has been the community wants to do this, but and and we say, okay, we can help with these things, and we talk to them and say, okay, this is the menu of things that we know how to do. It may not be correct for you. It is also highly dependent on many of your local factors. If we tell you this stuff. How does that jibe with the things that you know, right? So we're like creating a sort of like new hybrid localized knowledge with every group. And then what we try to do also is um, we're finally getting to the, the critical mass is too strong a word, but like almost critical mass, subcritical mass, whatever, where there are groups that are sort of regionally close to each other. And so they can teach each other, right? It works so much better whenever we can say like, hey, do you, can, can you like come over and help us? And like this person will like explain everything because there's like way more notebook knowledge, right? Um, and, and so I guess the general form of that is kind of like, we go where we're needed, right? Um, and where it's relevant. Um, and, and, and so because we're invited, because we're asked, the local community is already bought in. Right, it's something that they want, 
Like we have not done anything where uh, we won't sign a deal with a local government and the government goes to like local communities and says like, okay, now you're gonna do this, right? Um, I don't think that that works very well. And I think we don't need to do that because I, I think what happens is like, if you help one group of people be very successful, word spreads and then everyone else wants to be really successful. And then we get asked more, right? Like, I, I think that's actually the best way to like, like someone doesn't want to sign a deal with you, you don't have to sign a deal with them. You sign a deal with the next guy, right? Who wants to do it, right? And then they're bought in, it's their forest, right? Because right from the beginning, they're like, okay, terraformation will come in and they will help us restore our forest. So from the beginning, it's theirs, right? It, it's not like ours. We're just trying to spread all the knowledge that we have and make it available to everyone who wants it. All right, thank you. Very comprehensive. Again, I think Anna, you are next, and then we'll finish up with Will as, as our last question. Thank you so uh, much, and thank you guys for being an amazing host and, and special guest. Um, as a startup founder myself, I'm just super inspired. And Yisha, I didn't know that interintellect and terraformation actually had so many overlaps. You know, your exploration of how you decided not to be a nonprofit, even though there are nonprofit competitors in the space, how you know, um, being it on the market is is a forcing function and you actually have to make something people want and something that works. Um, and there's no real room for, for negotiation uh, with the public, which is driven by self-interest and like real world needs. Um, but also like the, your low tech approach, like my first company was insanely overproductified. And then with Interintech, we stripped it down to the most ancient tools for resiliency. And then we just build on top of that, right? Um, I even had this thought experiment of how like the best companies in the world would survive an apocalypse. There's no electricity, there's no Wi-Fi, but you still have Google, which is like Anton sitting under a tree and you can ask like, hey, wh where does Jim live? And he's like, third cave down. Um, or like <laughs> Facebook is this grandma around the fire who's like, David is out a lot these days, you know, and he has his, these new friends. It's so sus. Or like Airbnb, somebody like, People like you love this caveman. It's like there's such good view on the beach. And I, you know, it made me think like what, what would be a post-apocalyptic interintellect. And I realized like it's just us sitting around the fire, sharing stories and debating ideas and just, just went from there. Um, but as a fellow startup founder, I'm really curious. I love this idea that the competitor is like a backspace, like you learn from other people's mistakes and you use them as a user research pool. I would love to... If you're allowed to even speak about speak on it, like what are some of the things that you learn from competitors not to do in this space, whether as communication about climate change, which is a huge area of problems, right? Uh, how do we talk about it? How do we feel? Uh, how do we make how do we make people feel empowered in their decision making without like overinflating an individual's importance or overpromising? Um, but also like technically. Like, have you seen, you don't have to like name names, but have you seen stuff that failed and actually that led to you developing better products? Um, that was like four questions. I'm trying to sort of like tease apart like the fundamental question. Or, and, and what them, what and, do you do well that your competitors don't? And how, how what was the process of you learning from them? Um. Well, okay, so so here, here's this, like unusual, I don't know if it's like utopian or whatever, or unrealistic view that I have, but so far it's worked okay, which is like, we don't actually think of ourselves as having any competitors. Whenever we need to talk about, you know, other, other actors in our space, we, we call them comps for, you know, comparables. Um, and, and this isn't like trying to be whatever nice, I'm a very competitive guy. But like, it, it feels like in, in climate, the TAM is so huge. And if, if you sort of try to think about competing over whatever local area you're in, you're, you're really just like in the 1% of the whole TAM. So there's no point in competing. It's like if someone's sort of doing something here, just like go do the thing over here. There's like so much stuff to do. Um, and, and you're ultimately like more complementary than you are competitive. Um, and so, so I, I know I, I share this view with like a bunch of other players in the space, like most notably like Diego from Pachama. We, we actually like got together and like codified this. Now it was kind of easy because like our services are very complimentary, right? But we were just like, yeah, there's just like no competitors. You, like if I can make this other guy like succeed, it probably helps me. Um, so I don't really think about it that way. Um, 
if I were to think of like lessons from other players in the space, I would actually think about like over the last 30 to 40 years, like before we even came into existence, there were many, many attempts to reforest. Um, I, I think like the earliest paper that talked about about it was actually uh, in 1991, where I think someone wrote a paper, this is actually famous, I just can't remember the guy, about if we reforested the Amazon, we could really solve the carbon dioxide problem, was what it was called back then, right? And he had calculated, like, if you re restored, like, some some huge amount of the, the Amazon, you would you'd solve this problem. This problem was much smaller back then, right? And and all those calculations were based on, like, eucalyptus plantations. And, and so, like, what has happened over the last 30 or 40 years is there have been many, many attempts to restore forests or reforest all sorts of different land. Um, and a lot of times the way the press or discourse about it is, look at all these failed forestry projects. People have tried to do this and this has failed and this has failed. And if you do it, the, if you plant these plantations, it'll ruin the land. And if you like do this, it's like, okay. Except what happened really is some of those projects succeeded and some of them failed. And that is an enormous amount of data, actually, that mankind now collectively has as to what makes a successful project. And we've now been able to integrate all of that knowledge, right? This is why I go around talking about, like, you know, to, to lay people, I say planting trees or reforestation, right? To people who know what is like native biodiverse forest restoration in, con in conjunction with local communities, because those are, that, you know, those, that encapsulates most of the lessons, which is like, it needs to be native species, it needs to be a highly biodiverse mix of species. It has to be done in co-authorship and involvement of the local community um, because those are the primary determinants of success, which we collectively as mankind have learned through bitter experience of large scale failed projects over the past 30 or 40 years. Like, so our policies or our practices encompass all of these lessons. Um, so that's like the big, source of lessons. Another somewhat more recent one is, I guess, you could say like looking at South Pole, which isn't really a competitor because they're like a carbon trading company. They don't, they don't really like do projects. We, we, we are, you might call it like vertically integrated. We're like all the way down to like planting, all the way up to like financing vehicles, right? Um, is we certainly learned a lot about the fundamental uh, shortcomings of the Red Plus systems. I don't know if anyone's like really, is sort of familiar with like the different like carbon accounts. This is Red Plus and ARR. One of, briefly speaking, Red Plus is conservation of existing forests, and then, uh, um, and then ARR is planting new forests, right? And so like the count, the accounting methodologies for them have various flaws, and they also have sort of like some of the flaws have to do with ways in which the people who do the projects can kind of cheat or at least be not as transparent. I think many of them actually haven't cheated. It's just like, it makes them like very questionable. Um, and so like, there's been a lot of like, just like understanding how previous carbon projects have been mismanaged. So what we do is then we like manage them to like a higher standard of quality, sort of like where we think they ought to be. Um, and then the other one is actually working with local communities all over the world is a thing that basically if you work with any group that is not like your neighbor next door you don't know anything about them you don't know anything about other people and this was a lesson that has been like part of my career experience for a very long time now i would say actually now 20 years from now because like one of one of the most formative experiences i had was running the international engineering team at paypal and that was a different experience than any other engineering experience at PayPal. It was, you know, there's fraud and there's like technical aspects, you know, with all the PayPal stuff. But international really means like people are enormously diverse. And when I say diverse, I don't mean it in like the, you know, positive, oh, diversity is great way, which, you know, okay, it is. But like people are just really different and surprising. And you can't predict there's no there's no regularity 
to the diversity of human beings. They are just really different. Like if you've ever worked on any internationalization, internationalization project, you'll find that like, oh, well, we're gonna have to localize how we show addresses. In this country, the addresses are crazy in their format or like people's names are weird or like, you know, does anyone here do Duolingo? It's like the time date stuff is always like crazy, right? It makes no sense, right? Where like certain languages, like many languages have certain patterns. And then there's like the one language that has like weird like adjective nouns or whatever, or something like that, right? And like everything is highly irregular when it comes to human beings. And then, so that was like a formative experience for me. And I've carried it through all these subsequent things that I've done, right? Like Reddit also, like the enormous diversity of people on Reddit, right? And then now when working with, you know, just like a local community, like on the other side of the planet, right? You don't know anything when you work with them. And, and I think many, many people, like most human beings don't go that deep when they meet someone new. And so our company has, we have a set of company values. We haven't published them externally because I don't we just haven't yet. One of them is seek a deeper understanding. And it's a thing that we apply over and over and over because when you think you know something about the group you're working with or the conditions you're working under, you don't really know. And there might be, hopefully there's a little clue that you can sort of like pick at and be like, wait, is this thing that we think is true really true? Like, let's go ask them again. And then when they say the thing to us, or is it clear that the word that they use that we think means this actually means this? Like, keep asking. And it's like 10 layers deep. And if you ask enough, maybe you'll realize, oh, our understanding of this was totally wrong. And if we had moved forward based on this understanding, we would have screwed everything up. And so I have seen a lot of, not competitors, just like actors in the space, like working on projects or whatever. And like later you sort of do a postmortem and they'll tell you like, oh yeah. So like we thought this thing and it was totally tr untrue. And there was a clue early on. And if we had like just happened to know this, then it wouldn't have been a total screw up. And so we're like very, very conscious of the fact that like, you, you know, like biology is complicated. Humans are complicated and diverse and climate is like a totally unknowable <laughs> sphere of science, right? And so you're combining all three of these things. And it's not about, I can't even point to any like one lesson other than you got to dig deep. And when you think you know, you don't really know. And you got to keep digging. And hopefully you can get it to a point where you haven't made any fatal assumptions. And so far we're not dead. <laughs> but I totally fear that we'll be doing some project and we'll think we know something and then like bam it'll blow up in our face because we didn't dig deep enough so I love it it reminds me great... like, uh, I really if you guys haven't read like those of you who are open to such classic Norbert Wiener's cybernetics starts with this German nursery rhyme that and his point is that this is so wise I mean I'm not going to quote it in German and definitely um, I don't remember fully by heart but the whole point is that you know, God has created the planets and the planets are all uh, predictable, but then you try predicting the clouds and shit gets weird. Um, and then the whole book obviously uh, follows from 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 this idea. Um, Will, I'm passing the mic to you. Thank you for your patience with my quadruple question. Hey, thanks, Anna. Um, hey, Sean, I'm curious how you keep reforested land safe kind of 20, 30 years down the line, like once once the area does improve, is it, you know, and then it could be a kind of subject of the same incentives that might've kind of deforested it in the first place. Is that, is that all kind of solved under like, get the locals involved, they're going to be invested. Like how much does kind of opposing deforestation kind of fit into this picture? Um, well, we're not 20 years old or anywhere close to it. So, uh, so the strongest possible answer I can give you is actually kind of weak, which is, we have not done so, so we don't really know how. Drawing on the experience of the reforestation projects that have been successful versus the ones that have not, um, it does seem that the primary determining factor is buy-in and economic benefit to the local community. Um, another factor, which I think is not explicitly stated, is inertia. If you have a community which has known for a generation and its children grew up with 
especially witnessing the project being done by their parents and seeing how it's benefited them, the inertia is there where it's like, no, we're not going to fuck up our forest. In fact, we're going to try to keep making it better because it's good, right? So you want to invoke that effect. We've also seen um, a trend towards increasing value of forests. The, the, the trend is actually generally very slowly, but you know, not monotonically moving in the right direction. Um, and, and so what you sort of see is if you see an area with successful projects, um, other areas start to not get deforested as much, right? Like other similar things happen nearby. By, by the way, that, that's caused an ironic problem with, uh, if anyone is familiar with the red plus baseline problem, where you choose this area and it's like supposed to get deforested and you compare it to the area that you protected. And then they find out later that the area that was supposed to be deforested like en ended up not being deforested. And it was kind of because you were conserving this area and other people nearby were like, hey, that's a good idea. And let's conserve this area. And then that makes it so that like the carbon credits are like worthless, but really they weren't. They were actually like contributing to more conservation, right? And so, so when you conserve an area or you restore a forest, it sets an example, right? Like people sort of imitate what other people do, right? And so you build both uh, the sort of like clear community benefit, sort of cultural inertia, um, and then, uh, I guess like the other kind of culture, cultural inertia to not undo this thing that you did. And then cultural inertia for more people to support, you sort of normalize this thing, right? Like, hey, there's this community restoring this forest rather than cutting down and they're doing really well. Um, so all those effects seem to be the predominant effects that you know keep it going. Great. Well, Thank you, Sean. I think we're going to wrap here. Really appreciate the deep dive here on what you guys are doing and how it fits into this world ecosystem. It's obviously, you know, one of the most uh, important things anybody could be working on again. And I think that the, the message here is, again, really interesting. Uh, trees are pretty ancient, but this kind of coordination technology for doing this sort of work at scale is really new. And I think that this and other efforts in this direction definitely point to almost a sea change in our approach to conservation and environmentalism, that we can actually do positive things to influence the world, not just do fewer things that, that impact them negatively. So that's that's very, very exciting. Thank you very much. Now, Anna, do you have a couple of words to say? I, I'm just, I'm, first of all, I love your duo, like Anton, Yishan. I could listen to you guys talking about anything. Um, uh, maybe we should have like a wish box. Um, and just like, you know, kudos to this amazing group. I love it when we have a topic, you know, a, 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 to a salon topic where you, we can really nerd out and just like go at it from different angles. Um, I know that you are full of ideas. I read all the questions and comments in the chat as well. So I would say don't hesitate to follow up. Um, Anton is in the Discord, Interinteract Community Discord. I'm sure he will be uh, welcoming any questions there. Ishan is, as you know, hyperactive on Twitter. So if you have... Or if you sleep on it and you wake up with like the world's best question and you're like, oh no, it's too late. It's not too late. We're here and, and we are dedicated to this exploration. And, and I really want to do, you know, another salon in, in a year or so and, and see how these projects play out. Um, I'm super, super proud of what you're doing, Ishan. And this is, you know, if, if, if there's just like a 1% chance that you're you're saving uh, the plant for the future, I, I say go for it. That's a pretty strong... <laughs> It's a pretty strong person. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for being right. here with your time and knowledge and, and care. Uh, this this is what makes us us. See you later. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you.